Thank you, Judy and Brendan. Well, at this time, children are dismissed to Children's Church if you want to make your way out, um, children, up to the first grade. And for those who are staying, if you want to grab your Bibles, if you have one or a pew Bible that's in front of you, it will help you as we now to follow along as we now look at the scriptures together. Text this morning is 1 Peter chapter 2, verses 18 to 25. If you have a pew Bible, that's page 1888, 89, excuse me, page 1889. So we're continuing through a letter of 1 Peter, a letter from the Apostle Peter to churches across um, Asia. We're in a section of the letter in which Peter is very practically talking to them about what it means to live as a Christian in the difficulties of this world. 1 Peter chapter 2, verses 18 to 25, page 1889 in the Pew Bible. Would you follow along with me as I read, starting in verse 18? Slaves, in reverent fear of God, submit yourselves to your masters, not only to those who are good and considerate, but also to those who are harsh. For it is commendable if someone bears up under the pain of unjust suffering because they are conscious of God. But how is it to your credit if you receive a beating for doing wrong and endure it? But if you suffer for doing good and you endure it, this is commendable before God. To this you were called because Christ suffered for you leaving you an example that you should follow in his steps. He committed no sin, and no deceit was found in his mouth. When they hurled their insults at him, he did not retaliate. When he suffered, he made no threats. Instead, he entrusted himself to him who judges justly. He himself bore our sins in his body on the cross so that we might die to sins and live for righteousness. By his wounds, you have been healed. For you were like sheep going astray, but now you have returned to the shepherd and overseer of your souls." This is the word of God. Well, here's the question. What do you do when life is unfair? Maybe you've experienced the reality, maybe you've lived the reality of the old saying, no good deed goes unpunished. Times when you've tried your best, you've sought to do things right, tried to do good, and yet life gives you back. Difficulty after difficulty hits you with tragedy, pays you back with disappointment. What do you do when life is unfair? That's an important question because many of us experience that at some point. But our text today actually presses on us a more specific question. What do you do when people are unfair? When, what, what do you do when you suffer unjustly at the hands of others? When you give and receive back no gratitude, but instead get spite and hatred. When, when people take out on you their anger or their hurt for what you haven't done. When, when they return your goodwill with insult. When, when you're misunderstood and accused. When you're lied about. Or when people use their position of power and authority and hurt you. What do we do when people are unfair to us? I mentioned last week that this section of the letter of Peter, I mentioned just a moment ago, is intensely practical, addressing how Christians are to live in this world, and particularly Peter is concerned with how Christians respond to the realities of this life so that what people see somehow, by the power and grace of God, what people see in us is, not, is something different. It looks like we look like Christ. That's what Peter is aiming for. Christian witness in hard situations. And here, he is specifically addressing people who are in a very tough situation. These verses 
You saw in verse 18, first, first word, these are addressed to slaves. Some of your translations might say household servants. Uh, some of them might say servants. Some of them might say household slaves. There's some variation in, transi- in translations. But slaves is a good translation and a troubling word. And so we need to start by understanding that. But, but slaves is, a, is actually not the subject. The subject that is, that is actually whether we're a slave or not, and I'm assuming that all of you are not, that, that actually still addresses up, verse ni- addresses us. Verse 19, for it is commendable, hear the principle, for it is commendable if someone bears up under the pain of unjust suffering because they are conscious of God. This is what we're talking about this morning. Here's how we're going to do it. And again, there are notes in the bulletin if you want to take a look at them, if that would be helpful to you. The first thing we need to do is to clarify the subject the, the situation and the subject. What is being addressed here? Let's get clear on that. The situation and the subject of these verses. And then second, the, the, the practical application, because Peter gets practical. What do you do if this relates to you? So first, the situation and the subject. Life is unfair. Life hurts. People are unfair. People hurt. And, and he, hurt us, I should say. And Peter here is writing to people who know these realities very well. He's writing to, verse 18, slaves. So what's the situation? That, that's, there's a lot to say here. Again, we're talking on Wednesday nights if you want to talk more about any of this. But one of the first things to note, if we're going to understand this in its place, and I, can, I don't want to spend forever on it, but it's important to know that the slavery that's being exp- explained here, that's being spoken into here, is not the same thing as what we're familiar with in America. It is not race-based chattel slavery like existed in the South. That's not what was happening here. This was 2,000, 1,800 years before that. This slavery was a slavery of the Greco-Roman world. It was different. And let me just point out to you some of the ways it was different. And and I'm not saying better. I'm saying different. Uh, Slavery in the ancient world was not based on skin color or race. It wasn't. Uh, Slavery in the ancient world was a taken-for-granted part of Roman life, all of the Roman Empire. Uh, Karen Jobes, New Testament scholar, says every well-to-do Roman family had slaves, in some cases in large numbers, and in the Roman world, sometimes slaves owned other slaves. Uh, It it was widespread. Uh, It is estimated that in the Greco-Roman world, there were 12 million slaves. That's about 16 to 20 percent of the empire's population. In Rome, it was one in five people were slaves, which means in a, in a room about this size, there'd be 40 some slaves here with us today. Everyone would have known, one in five, you would have known someone who was a slave. You would, you would have owned a slave, depending on what your status was in society. That, that's much more widespread than even what it was in America at the height of slavery. In 1860, about one percent not 16 to 20%, about 1% of the American population were slaves, just under 4 million. So it was very widespread, and there was a great variation in the kinds of jobs that slaves did. Slaves didn't just just do manual labor. They could be field workers, but they sometimes managed large farms. They could be highly educated. They could work as teachers or doctors. Uh, sometimes, Sometimes people, because it was advantageous to them, would sell themselves into slavery. You see what we're talking about? We're talking about something that's different. Uh, And they could even earn money and buy their own freedom in the ancient world. There were provisions in the law for people to make enough money as a slave to buy their own freedom. And and the Apostle Paul encourages that. You may have wondered about this verse before. In 1 Corinthians chapter 7, verses 21 to 23, this is what Paul says. He, He writes to slaves in the church, and he says, "'Were you a slave when you were called?' That is, called by Christ. "'Were you a slave when you were called?' Don't let it trouble you, although if you can gain your freedom, do so. That's what he says. If you can get out of this, you should. Uh, So slavery in the ancient world was different. Just make clear, it's not the same thing as what happened in America. But as I said before, that is not to say that slavery in the ancient world was good. Paul wrote, if you can gain your freedom, do so. He, He indicated very clearly, even in that verse, that he saw no good in slavery. This is one New Testament scholar. Paul saw no good in slavery and gave his strongest and unqualified support for slaves to gain their freedom if possible. And the reason for that was because slaves, um, because he was concerned for his Christian brothers and sisters who were slaves. Uh, Slavery in the ancient world was a thing that was full of injustice, 
and, uh, and a lot of evil. A, a slave in the ancient world was a person in a situation of profound vulnerability. The, the, legal, the slave's legal status, according to Aristotle, was as a thing, a tool like a shovel or a hammer. The slave had no legal rights and was subject to the absolute power of the master, which meant, one, one New Testament scholar summarizes it this way, the more important question in the ancient world was not whether or not you were a slave, but who your master was. Because if you have a bad master, you are, there is nothing you can do. You have no legal recourse. Some masters could be good and considerate. Others could be harsh. And that's what you see here in verse 18, don't you? He's, Paul writes, slaves, he's speaking to them, in, in, is speaking to these Christians in this situation, slaves, in reverent fear of God, submit yourselves to your masters, not only to those who are good and considerate, but also to those who are harsh. And he is concerned for them because they could be mistreated by their masters. And this is the subject. This leads us to the subject. That's the situation. That leads us to the subject, and I've already mentioned it. What do you do when you suffer unfairly from other people? Here's, here's what he's talking about. When you do good, and notice he's very clear. He's, he says uh, the kind of suffering he's talking about is not what you get uh, if you do wrong. Verse 20, but how is it to your credit if you receive a beating for doing wrong and endure it? In other words, he's, he's not talking specifically even about when you do wrong. He's talking about when you do good, you do good. And instead what you get back is harsh treatment, unfair treatment, abuse and attack. Masters could and they did harm their slaves. And it was unjust suffering. And that is the point of connection for us. The reality is that in this world, not only will you suffer, but you and I will suffer at the hands of people. They will do to us what they should not do. They will treat us in ways we do not deserve. And if you're a Christian, what do you do? That's the situation. That's the subject. Here's how Peter answers it. He gives a, he gives a, a big picture principle. This is his answer. He gives a big picture principle to answer it. And then he gives us some practical steps. Look at the big picture principle just to get the big picture of how you respond, is in verse 21, how you and I should respond. Verse 21. He says, if, excuse me, at the end of verse 20, he says, if, if you suffer for doing good and you endure it, this is commendable before God. So you, you've got you've to go through it, he's saying, uh, and he's going to say how you go through it here. And, and the big picture principle is in verse 21. The, to this you were called, to go through this suffering, enduring it, for Christ, to this you were called, because Christ suffered for you, leaving you an example that you should follow in his steps. Here's the big picture principle. Here's how I want to summarize it and then show you two vivid ways that Peter ex illustrates it here. How should you suffer unjustly? The big picture principle is you, should, you, should, you and I should learn to respond like Jesus. I know that's simple, but it's profound. And he gives two images of what we're to do, how we do that. Here's, here's the first. Learn to respond like Jesus. Look at, he says, first, Christ suffered for you, leaving you an example. Leaving you an example. Every commentator, read a number of commentators, says, every commentator points out that the Greek word here is really vivid in a way that no English translation that I saw captures. It's really vivid. Leaving you an example. The, the word, the Greek word is uh, hypogrammon. My Greek's rough, so if you're a Greek scholar, you can correct me later. A Greek, uh, this Greek word, hypogrammon, which was, used, uh, which was used to refer to a pattern of letters of the alphabet over which children learning to write would trace. This is vivid, isn't it? So Right now, Ezra, our youngest Ezra, is, is working with his mother every morning to learn how to write 
his letters. And do you remember? Do, any, do you remember what it was like when you learned to write your letters? Often kids have this piece of paper, and there's a little dotted line in the shape of the letter, right? You know what I'm talking about, right? And you take your pen, and you follow the dotted line, and it's S, right? And you know what your teacher will do? Give you a sheet of paper where you do that over and over and over again. And then later, maybe the S is only a couple of times, and you learn to write it on your own. Do you remember doing that? Just watching Ezra and it's the S. And it starts out and it's, it's tracing it and it's pretty rough and it goes outside all the lines and it's a little. But as you keep doing it, you learn S, S, S. Here's the first thing learn to respond like Jesus. Peter says, Look at Jesus. Look at Jesus. What he is doing is giving you a pattern on which, which you are to learn, look at, look at, trace it, watch him, look at him. Learn till you learn by heart what Jesus is like so that your life begins to just naturally flow out like his. Trace him, trace him, trace him, look at him. Look at him, look at him. Learn to respond like Jesus by first learning who Jesus is, trace his life, and then by putting it into action. See the second picture that he gives. Leaving you an example, right, that you could trace of something to follow, to, to, to pattern your life on. Jesus left you a pattern to follow so that you would follow in his steps. It, it is... The point of learning the heart of Jesus is so that we would walk out and walk in the steps of Jesus, so that we would go where Jesus goes. We would do the kinds of things that Jesus would do, so we would be little Christs. Not Christ, there's only one of him, but little Christs following after him, Christians. Now, Peter, uh, excuse, excuse me, Karen Job, she's a commentator I mentioned. She, she, she writes this. This image, this is a strong image, this image of following in Jesus' steps. This is a strong image associating the Christian's life with the life of Christ because, listen, one cannot step into the footsteps of Jesus while also heading off in any other direction than the direction he took. You can't follow in the steps of Jesus and walk your own way. You follow in his steps and his footsteps, she writes, lead to the cross and through the grave and on to glory. And here's, here's the question before we even look at anything practically, because if, if you have really suffered unfairly, you and I are going to object, object to the practical steps unless we first deal with this heart issue. Friend, is the desire of your heart to trace the pattern of Jesus till you follow in his steps? Is, is your heart ready, willing to say, Lord, I want to walk in your way, not my own. It has to start there. At the cross, at the cross, I surrender my life. We sang that. And that's the first question, maybe just to wrestle with. But he doesn't, he doesn't stay there. That's, that's the starting point. Then he gets practical. He gets practical, and he gives us four steps of how to respond like Jesus when we are treated unfairly, when we suffer unjustly. Four of them, and I, I changed the first one a little bit in the wording I'm going to use from the wording that's on your note. You can cross it out if you like my new wording better. You can stick with my old wording. I wrote them both. Here's the first one, four practical steps in the path following Jesus. Hold your tongue or watch your mouth. That's the first one. Hold your tongue. Verse 22 and 23a. This is, this is the, the first part of 23. 
He's, he's saying, look, Jesus gave you an example that you would follow in his steps. Now he's saying, let's look at Jesus. Here's the dotted line S. Let's trace it. What did Jesus do when he suffered unjustly? Verse 22, he committed no sin and no deceit was found in his mouth. When they hurled their insults at him, he did not retaliate. When he suffered, he made no threats. Hold your tongue, first one. Hold your tongue. It's interesting that Peter starts all about speech. About speech and remembering Jesus. And he didn't, did he? If you read through the Gospels, he, he walked through. He didn't, he didn't defend himself. He didn't, he didn't insult anybody back. He offered no threats. You know, I wonder, Luke says that, that Jesus, do you remember, when he rebuked Peter, because Peter drew a sword, if you know there's a story, when, when they came to arrest Jesus, Peter threw a sword, drew his sword, wanted to fight to protect Jesus, if you remember the story, if you've heard it. And at that time, Jesus said, Jesus said, put your sword away, right? He said, if I wanted to, I could call legions of angels to come and defend me. He said it to Peter to tell Peter to say, listen, put your sword away. Do you know what Jesus never said to those who were attacking him? You guys, wait till the angels get a hold of you. Even that level, would he have been justified? Yeah. <gasps> no one was more justified. He committed no sin unlike us. <laughs> and yet he, he didn't he didn't revile when he was reviled back. He didn't threaten while he was suffering. And you know, I'm sure Peter knew it, but do you remember? There, it's not entirely true that he said nothing about those who made him suffer. He didn't say anything like this to them, but he did say something about them when he was suffering. Do you remember what it was? It was actually not to them. It was to God, his Father, as he was dying on the cross. He said, Father, forgive them for they know not what they do. Most gracious prayer. And so, first thing, if we're to follow in his steps, when we suffer unjustly, you better hold your tongue. This is very hard. Karen Jobes, um, that same New Testament commentator, she says, perhaps Peter begins by describing the suffering servant as a model for Christian behavior with these particular phrases because when people are treated unjustly, when we're treated unjustly, it is most tempting to respond by stretching the truth, he emphasizes deceit, by putting our opponents in a bad light, by speaking abusively of others, or by making threats. But following in Jesus' footsteps through this trying situation means not responding in kind to the accusers or using deceit or slander or threats. It's very hard. But this is the way of Jesus. We hold our tongue. And, and, and that's, but that's not all. We hold our tongue and, and trust the judge. Look at the second thing. He says, the example of Jesus, so we can trace it. Instead, instead of making threats, instead of retaliating, instead of insulting, instead, he, Jesus, entrusted himself to him who judges justly. Uh, this is important, just so we know. It is, this does not mean that justice does not matter. This does not mean, the fact that Jesus came slightly, does not mean that wrongdoing is not important to God. No. No. Uh, Peter, notice Peter calls a spade a spade, doesn't he? He says in verse 19, for it is commendable if someone bears up under the pain of unjust suffering. It, that, Peter is not talking about Roman law. Slaves could suffer anything and it was legal according to Roman law. It was justified according to Roman law. But Peter says to his brothers and sisters, your suffering is unjustified according to a higher law, according to a bigger court, and to a, according to a greater judge. This does not mean that justice does not matter. In fact, in chapter 1, verse 17, this is what Peter wrote to Christians. He says, you call on a father who judges each person's work impartially, meaning in the court of God, there are not some people and other people, masters and slaves. 
No, God is impartial and just, and he will judge. This does not mean, does not mean that justice doesn't matter. And and it is important to to note that even the place in which Peter was writing to these people, there there was at this time nothing they could do Legally, they had no one to appeal to to help them in this situation. They could not call any court or any uh, police force to come and save them. There was nothing they could do. But Peter is encouraging them. There is a judge who judges justly, but then he is calling them, he is calling them, he is calling them to trust this judge. And before I talk about what that means to trust this judge, let me just make something very, very clear very, very clear that we should not read this, we should not read this today as though this means that that abuse is ever excused. This is not excusing abuse. That's why I'm making a point of this. Thank God that today there are authorities that we can call that can deal with abuse that we witness. And the Christian community can and should speak up and deal with it when we see it. It matters to God i just read two verses to you. Proverbs 31, 8 and 9 says, Speak up for those who cannot speak up for themselves, for the rights of all who are destitute. Speak up and judge fairly. Defend the rights of the poor and the needy. Christians should take that seriously. But just like then, there are certain circumstances in which we we suffer unjustly and there's just nothing we can do to take it into our own hands to make it right. It's different circumstances, but you will in this life suffer something unjustly and there may be nothing you can do, no recourse you can take. And, and, And Peter says, hold your mouth and then follow Jesus first and foremost by entrusting yourself to the judge who will judge at the last day. Jesus walked by faith in this way. He said, Father, you will take care of them. I will pray for them. I will speak graciously to them. You will judge on the last day. He put himself into the hands of of God. And if we don't do that, even if there's something we can do to make it right, if we don't trust ultimately in justice to God, we will become bitter and angry and worn out. What, what Jesus did was to put it into the hands of God and say, some things are behind my pay grade, are beyond my pay grade. Things like judging the world. That is God's job. I will trust it to him. That's the second step. Jesus, watch your mouth, hold your tongue, trust the judge, give it to him. And that, that's an encouragement that there is justice, but there's a greater encouragement here. Just the third one, verse 24, which is remember his wounds. Look at verse 24. And he himself, now he's quoting both in, both in verse 22 and then in verse 24 and 25, he's quoting Isaiah 53, this magnificent prophecy of Jesus as the suffering servant. He himself bore our sins in his body on the cross so that we might die to sins and live for righteousness, for by his wounds you have been healed. Third, third thing, when we suffer unjustly, we hold our tongue, we Trust the judge, and we remember his wounds. Uh, Edmund Clowney, New Testament scholar, says that this word, points out that this word, and all the commentators notice this as well, that the word for wounds is, again, a very specific word. It's welts. It is the word that you use when you are beaten with a, with a whip. It's the word that you would use if you were a slave who was beaten with a whip. And it's a word that can be applied to Jesus who suffered this as well. And Peter uses this wound, this word. Every every commentator says it. Peter uses this word because it would have made the experience of of the slave pop out. If you suffered unjustly, he's saying, "You, you have in Jesus a friend who knows what that's like. You have in Jesus a friend who has suffered unfairly, 
who has, who has been wounded. And, and in fact, this is, this is his further word of encouragement. He did this for you. He himself bore our sins in his body on the cross so that we might die to sins and live for righteousness. Peter is reminding him that you matter to Jesus so much that though he could have avoided what you have unjustly suffered, he came and willingly suffered injustice himself for you. He gets it. And he loves you. Remember his wounds. And then is the last thing he says is, is rest in his care. Because ultimately what Jesus is, what Peter is doing is showing us not just an example, not just letters to trace, but he's reminding us that Jesus is not just a, an example and things you should do, but a living, a living Savior who died for you and cares for you. So verse 25 for you were like sheep going astray, but now you have returned to the shepherd and the overseer of your souls. Jesus, Peter reminds them, look, once, once you didn't, once, as he said earlier, once you were without mercy, but now you have received mercy. Now, once you were a lost sheep wandering on your own, but now you have a good shepherd who is taking care of you. Rest in that. Come back to him. There's a story Martin Luther King Jr. tells with the start of the uh, Montgomery uh, bus boycott. Uh, he was leading the, uh, the Montgomery bus boycott right at the start of the civil rights movement. And he talks about a woman who was a great encouragement to him. Her name was Mother Pollard. That's what they called her, Mother Pollard. He says she was poverty-stricken. She was uneducated. But she was, these are King's words, amazingly intelligent and possessed of deep understanding. And so she was at every one of the rallies, and at one of the early rallies, uh, King was speaking, and it was his night to speak on a Monday night, and he stood up and spoke, and afterwards, Mother Pollard came right up to him, and she said, something's wrong with you. You didn't speak strong tonight. And he said, no, 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 I'm fine. No big deal. She said, no, something is wrong. She insisted, and he said, she was right. <laughs> he said, uh, the fact was that the week before the days before, he'd been arrested, and he had received at his home multiple threatening phone calls. And he was, as he stood up to speak that night, he wrote, I was trying to convey an overt impression of strength and courage, but inwardly, he said, I was depressed and fear-stricken. And Mother Pollard saw right through him. And so she came up to him, and she kept pressing him, and he wouldn't, before he could admit it, because he wouldn't admit it, he was trying to put on this thing of straight strength, before he could admit it, she said, listen, she said, listen, I told you we are with you all the way. And he said, but then, this is his words, her face became radiant, and she said words that he said shot him through with courage. She said, but even if we aren't, God is going to take care of you. Now, that is Christian encouragement. We're with you, brothers and sisters, but even if we can't be with you at every moment, even if we weren't with you at all, God, the shepherd of your souls, knows you, loves you, will walk with you, and will take care of you. In fact, when you, this is what Peter says, he recalls the great, uh, the great parable that Jesus told of the sheep who wandered off and got lost on his own, and he says, all of us have done that. We have wandered off like sheep and gone astray, but do you remember who Jesus is? Do you remember who Jesus is? The one who, because of you, because he knew your name, because he knew the name of the one who wandered off, went out and searched until he found you. That's the language of the parable. Searched until you found you. And when he found that lost sheep, Jesus says, declaring the heart of God, when he found the lost sheep, he picked the lost sheep up and he put the lost sheep on his shoulders and he carried it home. And the part that I love is he carried it home rejoicing. That's what Jesus says. Not grumbling. That's what I would do looking for a lost sheep that wandered off on his own. Late at night, coming back through the field, grumbling, oh my goodness, the sheep, not Jesus. 
put him on a sheet, carries him back, rejoicing. The one who was lost is now found. That's Jesus. When you suffer, when you, when you hold your tongue, when you endure it and return blessing instead of insult, when you, when you, when you walk through it and keep going, following in the steps of Jesus, letting, letting this experience teach you to, to trust in the justice of Jesus so you grow in faith, when, when you walk through it, learning it to, to, allowing it to learn, to learn you, I was going to say to help you learn the compassion of Jesus because you know he suffered like you suffered. And when you go through it, learning to say, I'm not in control, Jesus is, I'm going to rest in his hands because he's the good shepherd who saved my soul and will bring me home. When you live like that, you don't just endure. You begin to follow in his steps, your life begins to show up in the world like Jesus, or I should say better, Jesus begins to show up through your life in the world. Rest in his care. This is who our God is. And boy, don't we need grace to live like this. So thank God that he has opened up a fountain of grace through the cross of Jesus that we celebrate at the table of communion. We're going to take a moment to prepare for communion, and I want to invite you to do a couple of things as you prepare your heart, just quiet prayer. As always, as we come to the bread and the cup, Scripture says it is good for us to examine ourselves, so it would be good at this time to bring your heart before the Lord, and if there, are, if there is sin you need to confess, including words that have been said, grudges that are held, bitterness that has grown, this is a good time to confess that, to bring that to the Lord. Jesus came to reconcile enemies. If you have some enemies, this is a good time to bring them to the Lord and pray for them and ask forgiveness for any way you've acted that needs forgiveness and to receive from God the grace that we need. Would you join me in a word of prayer? Would you take just a moment? 